This is the NDSA Infrastructure Infra Infrastructure Interest Group. Uh, my name is Nathan Tallman. We're here to do, uh, here on advocating for resources. All right. We're gonna give one more minute for folks to sign on and um, then I'll introduce our speaker. Um, looks like we're kind of stabling off. Oh, we got one more. Everyone have a nice weekend. Yeah, it was not too bad. So this is uh, this is Matt from Educopia and from Michigan. Um, we uh, we've had some cold temps and some snow, but um, uh, have been working on getting a uh, cabin set up up north and got that all on the property this past weekend. So so excited about that before the winter really sets in. Nice. Is it uh, for wintertime use? Uh, it's going to be uh, sort of a stepping stone to a bigger uh, home project on the property. So nice little temporary residence to, to park on while we do some work. Sounds nice and rustic. Yeah. Chance to disconnect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. There's very little signal up there. so. <laughs> All right. Well, um, thank you everyone for, for joining us today on the NDSA Infrastructure Interest Group call. Um, I'm going to introduce our speaker for today, um, and I hope you'll stay uh, after. We do have uh, some uh, fair amount of uh, interest group business after the call today, um, or after the, the sort of um, uh, presentation. Um, but getting us started today, we have uh, Salwa Ismail, who is AUL for Digital Initiatives and Information Technology and Associate CIO at UC Berkeley Library at UC Berkeley. Um, and uh, Salwa is uh, on the NDSA um, Coordinating Committee, um, has been active in these circles for some time, um, and has been an, also an administrative, um, you're an AOL now, uh, but you were in an uh, administrative position before. Um, so hopefully, we'll all learn how to wheedle our way into big bucks for digital preservation. Um, and just a reminder, um, the agenda notes document has community notes at the bottom. Um, please add yourself and welcome to join into the note taking. And take it away, Sola. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you, Nathan. And I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Let me know if you all have issues seeing it or there's a problem. Um, hi, everyone. It's really good to see some familiar names here. And Nathan was too kind in saying I've been active. For the past four months, I've been adjusting to my new position. So I've been a little less active than normally. Um, so when Nathan approached me earlier this year and he's like, well, would you mind talking about advocating for resources at one of our NDSA infrastructure groups? I was like, yes, because that's what I've been doing for the past 15 years in the jobs I've had. And that's what I know I'll continue to be doing for my administrators and my people will be asking me. So let's share, talk about this. Um, things that I talk about today are really not going to be earth shattering, but there are things that are often overlooked and I feel it's just important to keep reminding ourselves um, as we get so involved in the trenches of doing digital preservation, what is it that we need to ask for? Uh, I've timed my presentation to be about 20 minutes or so, and I'll leave 10 minutes for Q&A, and then the rest of the time can be for the um, interest group's um, interest business. So we'll get started. Um, sorry, here we go. So I actually read this quote, and Roger Schoenfeld is not someone I would quote for digital preservation, but I was reading his work on the scholarly kitchen um, in 2018 when he wrote about Deepin and when uh, Digital Preservation Network was um, 
uh, moving on to other things or changing, uh, moving on to other things, let's just put it that way. And this was very well said, where he said that the long-term stewardship of digital objects and collections through digital preservation is an essential imperative for scholarship, which we li libraries hold near and dear to our heart, and society, yet the value is intangible and the rewards are deferred. So um, it's this long-term reward versus an immediate short-term goal that you can see. So um, why does it need to be this way? So as I mentioned earlier, I'll be bringing a, pers two, a tale of two perspectives. Um, I've been directly involved as the department head for digital library and department head for library information technologies that had digital preservation as part of its portfolio. Um, and I say almost directly involved because I had an amazing team that did most of the work and asked for things and um, I would just make it look nice and pretty. And now I'm indirectly involved as I work with my library technologies teams and digital preservation units um, within the libraries. So ideas that I bring here are tried and tested and uh, many of them are things I've been through myself um, and again it brings a perspective from a state university that was funded very differently than a private university which was also funded very differently so um, to begin with why do we need to advocate for resources right and one of the for digital preservation like why can't it just be like books that we buy that is part of our collections budget or um, electronic resources that are becoming part of our that are part of our budget as well uh, or other things that libraries do and it begins with are we to being our can we tell our story through digital preservation and how does it help the library tell its story of the work that we do um, how can we get donors or university administrators excited um, new stories always help i know with academic preservation trust as their communications team was doing some of this work they were looking at how do you convince administrators and um, digital preservation coalition has these they have like a page filled with news stories of disasters that have happened, but it doesn't always have to be a doomsday scenario. However, news stories always help. So when the Brazil's National Museum um, had fire or the cathedral at Notre Dame in Paris had fire, um, um, there were stories all along like great things have been uh, we've lost great treasures and if only they had been preserved. And unfortunately, the reason it also needs to be done is because um, many of the administrators, myself included sometimes, have this perspective of, well, it's once preserved, that's it. You've put it in this dark archive and you're done. Wash your hands off and let's move on to the next thing. Um, however, if, we're, if things were only that obvious. So um, here's in a state of constant loop. Um, to start with advocating for digital for priorities and resources for digital preservation, it really does need to begin with clarifying the confusion around preservation, digital preservation services. Um, I remember when we had made a pitch for a digital preservation platform a few years ago to our um, university librarian, one of the first questions that was asked with this, well, there are all these services and you're asking me to join two different services and um, that's a lot of money. Mind you, that was only $40,000 of our budget versus the several millions that universities usually, have, libraries usually have for collections. Um, but it was still this state of confusion of um, why do we have all these different services? So clarifying, start, start with clarifying how do these services fit together in creating comprehensive preservation services framework? Um, do they complement each other? Are they part of an ecosystem? Do they um, compete with each other? Which they could be if you're looking at a vendor service and a community provided service. And then what are the gaps and where are the redundancies? So um, some of the gaps could be, well, we are storing our collections um, with our main campus IT or within the library's IT system. But storage, as we all know, and we've been told a million times, is not the same as digital preservation. But so what are those gaps and clarifying um, where redundancies do exist. So you might have a low level preservation system um, or, or a preservation workflow where you are bagging your files, you are making sure you're normalizing your assets and you're doing as much as you can without having a final system where they can go into. So where are some of these redundancies that you have that can help administrators better understand 
what the library's ecosystem and the library's state is. And then help them understand um, how do these things interact with institutional digital asset management systems. And when I talk about digital asset management systems, it could be your institutional repository, it could be your platforms that have digital collections, it could be your data repositories. But we know that digital collections and digital um, and data repositories have that buzzword and catchy word that have that has starstruck our administrators. So let's start with that. Something that they already have um, established and they already know is jazzy enough for the donors. How does it tie in and how does it help our digital asset management systems, data, digital, um, institutional uh, repository systems do better or enhance their services. And then finally clarify the confusion by providing a deeper understanding of the available tools and how it fits in with discovery and access. And this helps answer that question of, well, it's done. Why do we need to sustain it? Or, well, you put it in dark archive. Why do you need continue to need resources? And this helps them understand where access to your to the materials that we've digitally preserved comes in and how can they be discovered in the system as you need to work through them. So it's not a discovery system. It's not an access system, your preservation repositories, but how does it provide access and discovery to administrators, to librarians, to library staff who need to get access to it when you need to. Um, and so helping them, helping our administrators provide a consolidated understanding of what's being preserved and how it is associated with the organizational and institutional policy is important for your planning and implementation. It's also important as it helps you advocate for those resources that you need because you're tying it in with organizational and policy issues. And I will take a pause here and let you know, when I started putting these slides together, I was like, oh, I should put some um, vectors and illustrations. And then I moved away from it because I sometimes get slides myself that have a lot of images and, and, and very few words. And when you remove it from the context of what the person was speaking, um, it doesn't really make sense. So I'm sorry, but I did not put any images um, in any of my slides. So you'll just have to bear through black and white here. So um, advocating for resources, let's start with what are these resources that we're advocating for? Usually the first thing you jump in, we jump in and we're like money. And absolutely, I mean, money does solve a lot of problems. But there's also a lot of different ways to think about money. So um, whether your program is established, it's an established program run annually, or if it's a new program, because even if it's an established program, I have had administrators come back, and I'll address this later, ask me, well, should we really be preserving this? Like, should we scale back? And at that point, it's basically my resources are being asked to be taken away from me if we're talking about scaling back. Because again, it's one of those things, well, it's preserved, it's done, we're moving on. So um, the resources that we need are basically for, they're not a one-time activity or ask. So if your um, university or library is in the pro is in the habit of setting annual budgets, annual goals, um, make sure that you've asked for a position to continue ensuring, or positions, um, to continue ensuring that you're asking for professional development funding for other training, other things that support that position, um, inflation, if you are lucky enough to ask for salary raises. So, and thinking about it beyond just money, it's money that supports technology, but it's also people. You could think about realigning people, and we'll address this a little bit later. It's equipment. It's documentation. It's um, the time that's needed from the people doing the work, but also from you as the manager, as the librarian. Um, the policy, it's resources needed to put a policy together if you're establishing a new program, planning it, marketing this. And um, marketing is this part, which is like, how do we get donors and other folks excited? But even our administrators excited. Space, if you need to have space around this, other tools that are around it. And it's also resources that are needed to integrate the ex integrate your digital preservation into existing workflows, be it archival workflows or be it technology workflows, be it regular digitization workflows, because it will disrupt some of the existing workflows. And some of these resources will change based on if you're getting started or you're sustaining a program. You might ask for more money for marketing or tools or documentation time. Um, later on in, 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 in the process versus initially you might be asking for more money for just the people, the platform, the equipment as need be. 
Um, so what are the beginnings? How can we start advocating for resources? I've always believed, and um, I've been proven correct here, after, uh, that, that does your campus have a strategic plan? If it does, let's see how you can tie it into the campus's strategic plan by aligning it into a goal and objective from the library strategic plan. Does it fit into any category from your library strategic plan that actually then fits into your campus's strategic plan? Um, that is the best way to start thinking about how you're going to ask for resources and advocate for wanting them because if it fits in, it's actually a part of something that the library has already established as important. If it doesn't, um, then can it, can it be associated with some of the existing goals um, that the library has? Does the library have goals around digitization, digital collections, building up humani digital humanities, digital scholarship? Does the library have goals around web presence and websites? And I would be very surprised if we don't. So if you have those around, how can you include and actually align your digital preservation around these things, web archiving, let's preserve these digital humanities projects or where can we? And then that can help you tie it in with the mission goals and outcomes um, that are that benefit the library and that are part of um, the library's strategic plan. And as you're tying this in, uh, if you're lucky enough where your strategic plan asks you for resources needed, ask for the moon. My recommendation is ask for as much as you can, cushion things in because we're not going to get everything. At least then it registers in um, your administrators or registers with folks making the decision, well, this was asked, can it be deferred? Can, it, can we wait for it? Based on what was asked, what can we fill right now? What can we do later? And um, I, I would like to say when you think about building up a digital preservation program or you're talking about advocating for resources, think about these resources through the lens of inclusivity, diversity, and social justice. Do you have collections that would highly benefit from being, while all our digital collections are just as vital and precious and are, are, and are our digital treasures, are there collections that would benefit a little bit more? Are there collections where if we lost all access to these collections, um, it really would be the travesty? Or um, are there things that your archivists or special collections folks, or even your general library collection has purchased or um, has that would really be served well um, by being the first candidates of preservation or being the, 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 the example that you say that really need this preservation where you need the resources to help preserve these items. Um, the best form of advocating for resources in my eye, um, as far as I'm concerned, is stay in the admin eye. I'd may, I know that when I was doing this directly, when I was building up my digital library program in Florida, um, one of the important things I did was I made sure that we, when I had meetings with my, um, with my associate dean and when I had meetings with the campus administrators, I somehow tied in my conversations around digital collections or a digital project that we were doing with sustainability and highlighted how digital preservation is part of it. So um, do your highlights for preservation week. Um, I know and I've noticed this that many libraries sometimes as part of the preservation week that happens in spring usually focus on conservation efforts. Well, are there collections that you've preserved? Are there important things that you have um, preserved as part of your digital collection strategy that could be highlighted. In November, there's the World Digital Preservation Day. Tweet about it, toot your horn, talk about it. So make sure that the administrators are seeing it. I would, I have even tied it into Love Your Data Week. I know it's like data, but I've tied it in where we've done events around how do you preserve this data? How do you have, submit them into repositories? And from those repositories, they actually get pushed out to um, the digital preservation platform. And um, so that highlights these things that actually brings a little, that brings it closer to the administrator's eyes, that brings it closer to people who are seeing it saying, oh, they are doing these things. It's an active effort. Um, talk about news stories. Oh, this is the only image I have in all my slides, a little bow. So um, talk about news stories around interesting preserved materials. I mean, conservators do it all the time. Um, 
I remember when we were at, when I was at Georgetown, we used to talk about these beautiful books that were conserved um, you know, as part of the conservation process from our special collections, and then highlight how these books are now being preserved for the future. Um, tie them in with your digital collections or digital humanities projects, and then you get a double bang for your buck. You're highlighting your digital collection and you're highlighting uh, a digital preservation effort that happens at the same time. I know, and I, I use this term, I've used this term very often, I know that digital preservation is not sexy, it's not flashy, but we can definitely put a bow around it based on where it fits. I mean, it fits with our digital collections, it fits with our digital humanities and scholarship projects, and those things are sexy, those things jazz up our donors, like, yes, this is an awesome thing we did, and we're gonna sustain it for the next 15 to 20 years as part of our digital preservation strategy if we only had these, these X, Y, and Z resources. Um, another thing is be prepared. Sometimes you get lucky and there ends up being end of the year monies in some libraries. Um, and I said some because I've had years where we had it and I've had years where we didn't. Um, be ready with wish lists, uh, requests that you need. There's sometimes donors who come in in December and they want to write, do a tax write off. And if you're the first one who's able to give to your AUL or your um, UL, like, hey, here you go. This is what they want to do. This is how we can tie this into this flashy collection or this work that we're doing for this faculty member. Um, it'd be great if we had these resources. Have things ready to go on a day's notice because nothing like end of the year money and you need to spend it and you already have a strategy around it so you can just put it out there. Uh, you're not spending money a week later, it's not forgotten. And then keep your numbers. So you can justify everything and anything from um, the gigabytes and the terabytes and the exabytes of data that you're preserving to the kinds of um, resources that you're preserving, the types. Um, keep it in a way where we understand, which actually makes sense. So when I used to do my reporting um, around digital preservation and when I start doing my reporting here, one of the things I'm interested in is, um, Numbers ring a bell. People like hearing, well, we're preserving terabyte, 50 terabytes of data, 20 exabytes of data, um, resources. When I say data, I mean resources. Um, of this, 500 things or 5,000 things were audio, uh, audiovisual objects, multimedia objects. These were photographs. Have these numbers and these things ready so you can actually present like, hey, if we had $50,000, we could employ a metadata strategy that would help us with our digital preservation uh, because the metadata that we have can only go so far to tell us what's there. It doesn't tell me from the 500 um, items I've preserved, which ones can be, what was the provenance look like? What was the provenance metadata? So have these things ready um, so you can give these numbers and tie them in with the end of the year monies and wish lists um, that you can go. So now for uh, more advocacy. Try to sell your digital preservation with a twist. Um, one of the biggest successes that I had in selling our digital preservation strategy, um, I apologize for that noise, was when I was able to tie it in with the DMP plan requirements. Increasingly, we had faculty members, as we all know, as we all have, um, who wanted this data management plan for the data that they were gathering, particularly our faculty members from humanities and social sciences. And we actually were able to give them this digital preservation strategy tied in with their DMP plan requirements. Sometimes we got money out of the grant, sometimes we didn't, but the library was willing to provide more resources because we were then able to then, we were then able to support our faculty members with their uh, grant needs, which is a big deal at, you know, different, some at most universities, but it's a big deal for faculty members, especially in the humanities and social sciences to have them. Um, I would also say identify some measurable and uh, benefits that you can demonstrate of digital preservation that can be promoted um, as a communal responsibility um, that deserves funding. So we do know that administrators these days, we love community projects. We, uh, we love collaborative projects where there are different universities coming together. One of our biggest, um, when we were making a pitch for our digital preservation platform and the monies that we needed for, for supporting that and the positions was, um, this would be a community effort. The community would be helping develop this so we can actually identify the roadmap. And it, instead of just having a service that helps us off the shelf, this is something we can identify. And it, it, 
it actually um, rang well with our, my administrators back then, because what it showed them was we were working with other universities to develop um, a, a project that would benefit universities at large, benefit the academy. Um, try to explain. Sometimes as an administrator, I'll be honest, I myself don't think of future problems and risks that we're trying to solve where my department head has to be like, but you didn't think this, like this ties in with this. And I'm like, oh my gosh, yes. Um, so if you can, as you're advocating for these resources and why this is important, why do you need another person to do metadata for the preservation metadata? Or why do you need, um, uh, why do we need to keep pumping money into some other preservation repository. Identify what future problems and risks we're trying to solve here. And um, build on successes um, to date. Be like, hey, we were able to help 20 faculty members have their DMP plan because we had this. Because what this will help you with is when that question comes like, is it the library's role to pre pre um, preserve all of this? And I've ha I have been asked, well, is it the library's role to preserve all of this from software to um, audio video to textual to everything. And that's where um, having this clarity that we don't have to join the bandwagon for everything. What works for your library and make a case for what works for your library. Um, and I can tell you, uh, having worked at two, three different libraries now, what worked for one library did not always work for another library, or when it did, there were some deltas. So identify what those deltas are and make sure that you are making that case to your administrators, that you're not just joining the bandwagon, but that this supports your collections, and this is how it supports it, and this is where the library's role comes in. So. Um, Positions are the biggest thing, right? You, if, if you are able to secure a platform or a service or build your own um, repository, preservation repository, next up is these positions. It's, um, we already know that it's a multitude of positions that, are, that form a part of digital preservation. We need our archivists, our collection curators, our technology folks, our developers to our digital preservation and digital services librarians. Um, and positions will always be a struggle, no matter what. So can you think about proposing in a way where you can repurpose vacancies? Can you um, share time assignments or shared roles? Could your digital archivist be able to help you out for a few hours a week as part of their collections that are being preserved? Um, so think about those things as you're asking for those resources, because if you're asked, like, well, we can't fund four positions for you. Well, could you fund a position and a half? And then could this position, could we work with this position to add some responsibilities or change some responsibilities because they are interested or um, they have an inclination? Make a three-year plan of where do you want your program and resources to, uh, where do you want your program to be in three years? And then identify those resources as you're asking for these positions and other resources. At this point, I'd say, as you're asking for positions, it's also important to identify your internal stakeholders. What are you asking your developers? What are you asking your systems administrators or your DevOps folks? What are you asking of your archivists? And where does it fall? Where, where's the placement of what's being asked to help sustain this in their workflows and where can it fit in? Um, I would also say here, seek out the unusual, unexpected preservation candidates because they make for excellent stories. Um, when one of my libraries moved to doing a massive online open courses, MOOCs, it was the buzzword about three years ago. It was the only thing. The library was invested. The university was invested. We were, there was money put forth for it. And the library thought its role would be in part of um, through instruction, through copyright. And lo and behold, actually our important part was through preservation of these videos that were then being created and being provided to edX. Um, because we ha they had no way to preserve it so that if they wanted to go back and reuse it. And that actually emerged as one of the largest um, advocates for us where we're like, yes, you're preserving MOOCs videos. Clearly you need resources. Let's see where we can find you people and the money to support some of your um, preservation repository costs. And um, don't shy away from making exact predictions and then cushion them. Uh, hello, inflation. But, you know, you want three positions, ask for four because chances are you will get three positions as um, 
or you want four position at four positions ask for five make some make sure that you're cushioning um your ask so that when it does get reduced it doesn't get reduced down to the bones you still have a little bit of meat left and um I, I, I will use this as a perfect example where I was chatting with one of my colleagues, one of my uh, department heads, and she's like, well, the deadline, you know, we can get this done by December 15th. And I was like, how about we make it December 20? And she's like, oh, thank goodness you're cushioning it because I'm not, I wasn't sure I could deliver by the 15th. And I'm like, that's great. And that's the reason you made an exact prediction, and then we're going to cushion this. Um, one of the other stories that I've heard from a colleague of mine, this was one of my colleagues in, who works at a different library, she said, well, I just expect administrators to know exactly what we're doing so they can be like, well, you're doing all this work. Let me give you money to do this. And I was like, no, that actually, um, that doesn't always happen. It's up to you to ask for things and then help us understand why you need them because I'm not following your day-to-day, hour-to-hour what you're doing. So I actually don't have an idea that you've deposited 20 terabytes today or you're in, um, you're in total deposit another 50 and we're going to run out of our quota. Those are things that just don't bubble to the top sometime. So you tell me and then I'll be like, oh, this is what we're doing. So that's important. And um, it does help. Again, as I said, don't join the bandwagon, figure out what your deltas are, but it's also always helpful to show what your current and aspirational peer institutions are doing. We love collaborating. We love saying, hey, we're working with four different universities to do this. Um, so show them what, what other universe institutions that we aspire to be are doing. And then ask like, hey, they have five people doing this. Could we at least get two? Hey, um, they have a whole digital preservation lab. Could we get half a lab? Could we get a desk? Could we get a resource, a, a two workstations? But um, where can you tie this in? Because the collaborative cooperative approach always helps. Continue articulating how it fits into the process and the policy. How does digital preservation continue to fit in to the policy that you have, the processes that are already existing? And the more internal supporters you have, the merrier is the journey, the easier it is for you. If your special collections is advocating for it, your systems administrators are like, you know, you're filling up our cloud storage, let's talk about something. It actually makes it easier saying, I'm not, I'm not the lone pioneer asking for this. The library as a whole, our workflows and policies ask for it. Um, simultaneously, I do want to add here that as we're asking for these resources and you're advocating for them, be prepared to pause and realign and restructure if asked or needed. And this ties into that, is this the library's role? Well, um, let's realign. What is the library's role? If we're starting at it with the strategic plan, the university strategic plan and the library strategic plan, then yes, it is the library's role. But if we need to realign, well, maybe we need to focus on some other collections. Maybe this year might not just not be the best asking for positions, but I might be able to get away asking for money for a platform. Realign and have that ready to go so you can you actually can still get the support that you need. And um, another thing to consider is depending on your institution's reporting lines, are there other campus initiatives that you can tie into? So at Berkeley, we have something called Reimagining IT, One IT, where different units come together and we support the IT processes. And if digital preservation can fit into the re-IT policies and the library's strategic plan, then again, you have a double whammy where there are two things it fills a gap into and add asking for resources makes it easier. And finally, I would say ask, ask, and ask. Like if, when I first started, I used to, I, I, I was of the same impression where I was like, well, my manager knows we're preserving all these collections. So they know our costs are going to go up. And then when we started back up using Amazon Web Services as our staging area, it's like, well, they know AWS costs will go up because we're using this for this purpose. And um, they actually don't. So ask, ask for the money. Don't be shy. Don't think they're going to think you're greedy and that you're asking for the five positions and only getting four. Because the worst that can happen is, you're said no, and you're no better off than where you were. But if you do get what you want, then guess what? You're four positions up. I don't know why I keep saying four positions. Um, I think I've just stuck with that. And finally, I'd like to say um, all these asks that you have, all these advocating for resources, tie them into appeal to the key motivators for the library, for the library administration. What is the library's accountability? 
if you are a state university, are you responsible for uh, re retaining the records? Are you responsible for keeping the archives? And how do those archives manifest in the age of born digital? So appeal to that. That's where your digital preservation program comes into place. That's where the resources are. Are you required to maintain the authenticity of the records that you have? Um, the cultural memory, the reputation. Um, how are you enabling research? Uh, compliance? Future costs of inaction, which again ties into the reputation part. Well, if these things are lost, they're gone forever. Um, could they be revenue sources in terms of grants that you might apply? You might have uh, faculty apply and then bring in a little bit of money to help you towards uh, your digital preservation. And then finally, business continuity. If things um, things happen, um, calamities, natural disasters, it'll help ensure business continuity, even if physical objects sustain damage. So tying to these key motivators, have your numbers that support this data. And um, those, and that'll make for very strong cases for advocating for the resources that you need. And at this point, um, I'm happy to take any questions. Um, I know I said I'd, I'd be done in about 30, 20 minutes, but I think I've gone over a little bit, but I think we have time for questions, Nathan. Yeah, we can take a couple questions. And as I said earlier, nothing that I've said is um, earth shattering or things we didn't know, but it's good to be reminded over and over again. Um, I, once again, I, I'll say the ask, ask, ask is important because I had gotten into a position a few years ago where I had stopped asking, where I was like, well, they know what I'm doing and they know how vital this is. Um, and I realized while they knew it was very vital, they thought I was doing it quietly and happily. So clearly I didn't need things. Or I'll just change the cat so you will, I, will be, I won't be lying. Um, I'll, uh, I'll ask one question. Okay. Um, what, uh, what would you recommend when um, you, you do some of these things or you ask, but, but the, the only things you, um, you're able to get are, um, don't match with the need. You know, you get the wrong type, you, you need people, you need something bigger, but you get furniture. Um, you need people and you get equipment. Um, you know, it's like the, the opportunities that are available um, don't meet the need, but uh, people uh, who are able to give you resources almost like force them upon you because it's all they're able to. So um, I would say some of this depends with budgeting lines, right? So the way our budget and finance is set. Um, uh, personnel budget is very different than, than uh, non-comp budget, compensation budget. So it's almost, a, I think at that point, it really is a matter of conversation with your administrators and whoever's your, if the library has a director of finance, whoever manages the budgeting lines in terms of where, if there are any trades that are possible. Um, so you are getting your furniture for 5,000 and you are getting uh, equipment for 10,000, that's 15,000. While that comes from non-comp, and I, I, call, I say non-comp because that's what we call it here, but non-compensation budget, um, so it can't really be taken from your compensation budget. So then it's a matter of somebody up there playing this Russian roulette, figuring out, is that 15,000 that could be moved into someone else's budget where a compensation budget could um, give you that money? So you can hire not a full-time position, but maybe a contract position, a temp position. More often than not, sometimes, well, I shouldn't say more often than not, sometimes that happens because Honestly, the people when they're making this decision don't really understand what your advocate, I shouldn't say don't really understand. They're like, well, they ask for equipment, they ask for people, we'll give them equipment this year, we'll give them people next year. But it's like, wait, I need people to set up the equipment. Um, so we'll just move, we'll just find money next year to find them, um, to, to give them the person. And this year we'll just give them the equipment because the money's there. So it's actually having the, if you are lucky enough where you can sit down with your department head or your AUL or um, your finance person to understand, are there lines that can, 
are there budget lines that can change or move or can you hold back on that equipment because yes while it's great to have that equipment i will have no use for it unless i have people um another recommendation for that would be if it is something that you just cannot get people for don't give up don't do not lose your money for equipment that you've gotten take that money um and then see if you can bargain or negotiate for someone's time within the library is there somebody in archives, a specialist or somebody who's really interested in learning and would be willing to give you 15% of their time or 10%? Is that a negotiation that can happen? I knew at one of my jobs, um, we had colleagues from our technical services department who were very willing to be cross-trained. Yes, um, it did mean there'd be more work involved in training them and bringing them up to speed. But once I had that, it was actually even better because um, then I had this pool of uh, personnel resources I could draw on if positions ever went vacant or uh, people quit. So thinking about that realignment, and that's where one of my slides said, like, be ready to realign, restructure. And um, sometimes you're just not going to get it. And unfortunately, well, it's just a matter of waiting. I still remember I had asked for a position for three years before I left. Um, I'm being told it may or may not just be getting filled. So there you go. Three years later, it is coming to life. I hope that kind of answered the question, Nathan. No, it does. Thank you. Helpful. Were there any other questions before we um, moved on to interest group business? Well, thank you very much. Uh, there's a great presentation. Um, I think I've transcribed most of your um, slide Point. I'm happy to share the slides with you as well, Nathan. Okay, if um if, if you want to shoot me those in an email, I could get them linked in the in the notes. Um, Absolutely. Off from there. Perfect. Um, Thank you, everyone. And if you have questions, you have my you know how to contact me. So feel free to send me an email or um, DM me on Twitter. Thank you again. Um, Appreciate your, your time and your expertise. Okay, interest group. Um, we have some, um, some business to, uh, to discuss here. Um, I did move um, something up, uh, rearrange slightly the, the business topics for the agenda here, starting with, um, with leadership instead of ending with it. Um, so um, I've been uh, trying to uh, recruit for the past few months um, uh, another co-chair for the group um, at the uh, working lunch meeting in Tampa. Um, did get some folks um, who expressed interest um, and I'm uh, pleased to uh, announce we do have some folks coming on. Um, Matt Schultz and Lee Prescott will be coming on as co-chairs for the Infrastructure Interest Group um, starting in um, around, you know, next month, 2020-ish. Um, Matt currently co-chairs uh, the Content Interest Group and the Cloud Studies um, subgroup. Um, Matt will be transitioning off the uh, Content Interest Group um, there'll be a little, a little time there while well, there's a leadership transition there. Um, and the cloud studies group is actually going to be rolling um, into the infrastructure interest. Um, and that connects to another one of our um, agenda topics, our um, topic planning for next year. Um, Lee has been active in our group for, uh, for a few years. She's been active in the NDSA levels project. Um, so I'm looking forward to, to working both with Matt and Lee in these roles. Um, I will uh, remain on the group as a, as a regular member, um, joining calls and stuff like that. But um, leadership of the group will be sort of transitioning into Matt and Lee's hands. Um, I'm going to help through this transition here for December. Um, but uh, in January, it's going be, gonna to be their group. Um, Matt and Lee, um, is there anything you wanted to, to say? This is Leah. Uh, 
No, not really, other than um, uh, cautiously looking forward to <laughs> getting a little bit more involved uh, at that level. So do my best. <laughs> well, Leah, Leah, this is Matt. Um, I'm looking forward to working with you on the group. Um, yeah, and it's been it's been great having conversations with um, with Nathan and Corey over the past year here about um, potential opportunities. So, yeah, thanks uh, thanks for the invite, Nathan, and thanks for the opportunity. Looking forward to it. We're happy to have you both both on board. Um, I guess I'll type up the notes for this page. Um, so the next thing. Um, is the meeting topics um, for 2020. Um, let me grab this link to throw into the chat here. Okay, so in, uh, in Tampa, we did start to go over or, or do some round robin suggestions of meeting topics for, um, for 2020. Um, so from that, um, developed this, um, this sort of, uh, survey, this tri cider thing, um, which allows you to vote on topics that have already been suggested. You can also add new topics and other people can vote on those as well. Um, this voting will be um, sort of up and open through, I think it's uh, like December, December 15th, maybe. Yeah, I think it's open right now. Until, um, basically until just about before the next meeting um, to, to sort of pick out what our, our topics would be. Um, there's several cloud, cloud topics that um, related topics that came up. Um, there's some other topics as well, but folks, um, please do suggest additional topics on here. I think at least one was suggested since, um, since I put this together. Um, that, those are just the topics. There's, there's one other thing to decide on as a group. Um, and that's, do we still want to sort of do every quarter have an open agenda call? Um, that's something we started to do last year. We didn't do the year before um, where we, we don't have a, a predefined topic and then we just sort of hold the call and folks can call in and talk about any sort of topic of the day, issue of the day, um, um, something that's, um, facing their work um, and, and they just sort of want to have another group of professionals to talk to. Um, generally, I'd say that those meetings had a, um, a lower turnout and, um, you know, sometimes, uh, sometimes those, those calls were uh, more, more facilitated than member driven. Um, which isn't a bad thing, um, but just it'd be good to know if people, um, how people thought about that. Um, that's something we should do again, or maybe do it, um, you know, twice instead of four times. Um, how, do, how do people feel about that? And it's okay if you don't have an opinion either. This is Leah again. I can say that in the times that I've, had to chair a group that is a conference call scenario. It's really, really hard to get uh, sort of just off the cuff participation. So uh, I, I don't know how to get beyond that. I something I've thought a lot about, uh, but I, I I don't know. It's just it's too easy. Uh, to not participate. So, which isn't to say I don't think we should do it. I'm just saying I, I, I think in, uh, to some level it's sort of doomed from the beginning. <laughs> Fair point. Anyone else? Uh, Nathan, this is this is Matt. Um, just just for my own edification, I guess going forward, um, what uh, you know, what were some of the the outcomes that would? How have you seen those open agenda calls? You know, sort of um, lead to some um, some momentum in the in the group, or um, has it taken conversations in any interesting directions? 
Mm -hmm. Kind of jump back through um, some of our notes here. Um, I, I don't think there, you know, anything super, um, super riveting sort of emerged. Um, you know, I think I was able to get into some of my hobby horses on on some of the calls with um, like OpenStack. Um, let's see, the July meeting was, uh, was an open agenda call. Um, and having a smaller group, just to jump back for a second, isn't necessarily a bad thing either. Sometimes yeah. you go into deeper, deeper conversation with a smaller group. Um, let's see, there was some conversation on collaborative infrastructure. It's interesting, some, um, different including some, uh, some international collaboration. Um, so it, it's, it's hit or miss probably is a good way to put it as to what sort of a, how substantive the conversations are on the open agenda calls. Um, here's April's and talking about digital preservation storage and sensitive content. That one was interesting. Mm -hmm. I remember that one. Um, also talked about disaster planning and if anyone used an AWS snowball. So it is a bit of a, um, a grab bag of stuff that comes up. Um, let's see, the first call we did in January of this year was an open agenda call. Um, DPN was a conversation topic. Um, communicating differences between cloud storage and preservation. So you, um, you're saying even though the, the calls have lower attendance, the conversations are sometimes quite, quite robust. They can be. Okay. If you get um, um, an, engaged, an engaged group, of uh, folks. And have you had uh, many people who, you know, maybe uh, post call who uh, didn't attend, follow up with questions or? Less often, um, at least who, who follow up on the list or with myself directly. I can't say others who were on the call didn't have folks follow up with them directly, but I haven't heard of that. Okay, great. You could also, um, you know, you could leave four spots open, um, do one, and then fill it in, fill the other four in, or fill two of them in or something, if you feel like the first, uh, first quarterly open agenda, you know, wasn't worth it for anybody. You could kind of play it by ear, hedge your bets. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's a good idea. Has anybody on the call um, who's been on the open agenda calls uh, thought that they were either, you know, really, really useful and would, would, you know, advocate to keep on that, that sort of unscheduled space or, or sort of have a contrary opinion of, eh, I would have rather have had a, a specific topic or, oh, I, I skipped that month because um, I didn't, I did, there wasn't anything I knew I wanted to hear on or talk on. Well, I think this one might be up to the co-chairs. It was a request that came from membership to have some open agenda calls um, on the schedule. Um, there probably should be some space there. Um, okay. We've probably discussed that one enough. Um, we have five minutes left. Okay. So voting ends, yes, December 15th at 5 p.m. for the meeting topics. Um, the last thing, um, NDSA uh, coordinating committee 
Um, it's just asking all of the groups, be they interest groups, working groups, um, to just sort of review um, their sort of charges, descriptions, scopes, um, to see are they, their names, are they what they need to be? Um, does do any of them need to be adjusted? Is infrastructure interest group the, the most appropriate name for this group? Description that's on the, the web page. Is that um, an accurate reflection of the topics that this group discussed? Um, is there anything you know that needs to to change? You know, particularly, you know, recognizing that the the, um, the cloud studies group is coming in. Is there anything maybe that the language that should should change to better reflect um, the the inclusion of cloud infrastructure as well? Um, so that's just sort of a, a general thing. Um, I think Bradley Daggle, the uh, coordinating committee chair, would be interested in having this done sooner rather than later, perhaps even before the next coordinating committee call. Um, so if, if people uh, have any um, opinions on this topic, if they could please um, speak now, email um, myself, Matt, or Leah, um, or add notes to this, um, so add notes into this document itself, the notes document here, section. That would be good. Generally speaking, I, I don't think we need a ton of change, um, but I haven't sort of done any deep thinking on this. Um, clearly, there's some some basic change, like from the, the contact information for the group co-chairs. There's some, some sort of hygiene things, so to speak. Um, but I think the sort of basic overall structure seems to be fairly sound um, from, from my sort of initial take. And uh, Nathan, this is uh, Matt. I'll just chime in and say um, we, uh, we we typically hold the cloud, we have been holding the cloud studies calls the last Friday of each month. Um, uh, the last Friday of this month obviously runs into the, the holiday here in the States. Um, so we're going to be um, hosting a cloud studies call this coming Friday. Um, and Nathan and I will be talking about some of the transition over to the infrastructure interest group um, and we'll invite uh, all the folks who have been, some of whom are on the call here uh, today, who've been attending the cloud studies calls pretty regularly um, and encourage them to look at this language too and see if there's anything that um, uh, that they'd like to see uh, edited or added to it, so. Great, thank you, Matt. Um, can you, what, what time is that call at, 3 p.m.? Uh, we uh, typically have held it at, uh, at 1 p.m. on Fridays. Um, and I'll have that, that going out. Um, if you can't make it, Nathan, it's, it's not the end of the world, um, but we'll, we'll make sure to cover, you know, all of the transition, uh, give folks, a, a, the folks who've been attending the cloud studies call over the past year, um, we've been talking a fair bit about uh, the potential migration of that group over to infrastructure. So it won't be a surprise to anyone, I don't think. Um, but uh, they, they'll be interested to take a look at um, what all is encompassed under the description for the infrastructure group currently um, and see if there's any adjustments that they'd recommend making there. Um, I think the, you know, the key thing with the transition of the cloud studies group over to the infrastructure group is the, you know, the intense focus that we've had on uh, cloud storage and cloud services. You obviously this, um, particularly in the past year or so, there's been great topics here on the infrastructure group that, um, that are touch points in the same way. Um, so there's, I mean, it's some of that has been um, cause for us kind of visiting, like how, how much overlap is there? Um, you know, what's a healthy overlap? Um, when is it time to kind of make the transition over? Um, so, but I think the, uh, you know, the, the, I have all the assurances um, based on conversations with you and Corey, um, you know, that, that people who've been attending the cloud studies group will get a lot out of the topics that have been popping up and are, you know, sort of slated to pop up uh, on the infrastructure group here going forward, so. Should be an easy transition. Sounds good. Um, the Friday, the 22nd, 1 p.m. Eastern for a cloud studies call. And you said you'll be emailing um, the details for that to NDSA all, if folks yep. wanted to watch for that and the connection details. Yep. Okay. Uh, is there anything else anyone wanted to bring up? Right, I believe we're at the hour.
Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks, Nathan. Thanks, everybody. You. All right. Take care.